Okay, thank you for your patience, those on the phone. I'm Lori from HIS Talk. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our very first virtual book launch. Today we'll be talking with Ed Marks about his book, Extraordinary Tales from a Rather Ordinary Guy. Released just last week, Ed's first book will inspire you and give you some ideas about how you can live the kind of life you've always wanted to live. His premise is that even an average person like him can live and work above average simply by applying a few principles into their life. Ed will explain the premise of the book and delve into the key principles of it. He'll also read one or two of the extraordinary tales that have never been shared before. This is an interactive webinar and we encourage you to ask questions. Attendee phone lines have been muted to prevent background noise, but attendees can pose questions using the chat function and Ed will respond to them real time. Um, another option is to use GoToWebinar's questions box in the console and submit questions that way that he'll address during Q&A at the end. Attendees who take advantage of the interactive features are eligible to win free books as well as a Kindle. Win winners will be announced at the conclusion of the webinar. Today's launch is being recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording in the follow-up email from us. Those are all the announcements I have, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ed. All right, thank you, Lori, and, and I profusely apologize for my tardiness, and so I'm glad people stuck with me, and um, hopefully you'll find this have been uh, worth your time to stick it out. So with that, let me just talk a little bit about the book and uh, tell you sort of the evolution of it and what I hope people gain for it from it and why I wrote it. So let me advance the screen. which is going to be a technical challenge for me here. Um, I think you can just hit enter. Okay, I, yeah, I had it on a different function. So there's the book cover, and uh, the book officially was released a week ago, Thursday. So it's been out for about 10 days. Uh, as Lori mentioned, it is my first book. Uh, I do have another one in the works with uh, through HIMSS Publishing. Um, on innovation, and we're really excited about about working with him on that particular uh, book, and I think it'll be helpful uh, for the industry as we always try to innovate and leverage technology to enable uh, superior business and clinical outcomes. Uh, but that is the book cover that you're looking there, looking at there, and um, this is another shot from the cover. You know, and as Lori mentioned, and is obvious from the cover, the name is Extraordinary Tales of a Rather Ordinary Guy. And the premise really is, is that, and those who really know me understand this to be true, I am a very, very average person, and I've been fortunate to have had uh, some extraordinary things happen to me. And so people often ask me, and so one of the reasons that the book was written, people would often approach me and ask me, you know, how do you have these amazing stories uh, in your life? And I think they, they expect an answer to be, you know, that I was born in a rich family and had all these different opportunities or... Uh, you know, grew up with a silver spoon type of situation or, or if there were some sort of magic fairy dust uh, that might have helped me. But the answer is, is none of them. And that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is that this really is a book for an everyday person such as myself. And that being an everyday person, you can still have these just amazing things that happen in your life. And when I reflected on why these sort of things happen, I realized that it was largely around certain principles that a lot of people live. And, and I think if you truly embrace these principles, you'll find that even being an ordinary person, you can have this uh, sort of extraordinary uh, experience. And I often would tell people, look, if I can have these sort of experiences, anyone can, because uh, it's been a very difficult road for me. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as I get into it. So this screenshot, just for those who are interested, um, is the order you will find uh, the capability to order on Amazon. I think it's in Barnes and Noble as well. I've not checked out my local store, uh, but definitely on Amazon. It will be reported as out of stock, uh, but you can still order. Uh, and then I think the latest date that someone mentioned to me was January. So um, they're back ordered a little bit, but uh, I would still order it. Uh, and hopefully the publisher in our printing um, printing house that our publisher has uh, will up here pretty quickly. So 
So it really is true that uh, I'm a very ordinary person. Here's a screenshot of my family. Uh, but I was raised in a very uh, poor circumstances. Uh, I had uh, wonderful parents and, uh, and, and brothers and sisters and those sort of things. Uh, but we are very poor. We grew up in uh, southern Germany, known as Bavaria. And uh, our, our beginnings were very auspicious. My parents are survivors of World War II from Germany. And uh, they, my dad was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, my mom uh, barely survived the war herself. Her father was in the German army, uh, was killed in action. Uh, and so they met, had started having kids, and um, there's a screenshot of our family growing up in Germany. That's how we dressed. We even dressed like that when we came to the United States, which wasn't something that I would recommend for anyone, but it did make for an interesting experience. But any, at any rate, uh, there was nothing special about my upbringing. In fact, uh, as I became a teenager, I had a pretty troubled youth. Uh, so again, I didn't, I didn't have this experience where everything was perfect in junior high or high school. In fact, I was uh, arrested a couple of times uh, for doing things that delinquents do, wayward type teens do. And uh, so again, very auspicious uh, beginning. My grades were not stellar. Um, in fact, they were very, very bad. And uh, if you were to look at who I was as a teenager, you wouldn't think that my life would amount to anything. And uh, so, again, going back to my premise that, you know, very, very ordinary, not super smart, not super talented uh, in any specific way uh, was the way I grew up. So I eventually made it to Colorado State University. So back then, it didn't take a whole lot of great grades to make it uh, to the university, to the state university at any rate. And, um, you know, I flunked in my um, first semester. So even prior to going to school, uh, my first semester, I joined the Army Reserve. And uh, I was a private at basic training. And I almost got kicked out of basic training. I think um, I was in, in, literally in a line to be kicked out uh, of basic training for a variety of reasons. And I, I don't know if it was a providence or um, the commanding officer had to get home for a personal emergency or something, but uh, I was the last person in line, and uh, right before they got to me, uh, that officer left, had to go. Um, so I was not kicked out, and I, and I made it through. But again, nothing special at all about uh, who I was. Um, so in my first job, I was fired. So. Um, again, so whether it was my education experience where I had a 1.6 GPA my freshman year or my first job, um, it was very, very, I wouldn't even say average, right? You, you would say all those things together was very below average. And um, part of my college experience as well was a lot of drinking. And so, again, my point being in sharing all these little anecdotes with you is that there's nothing special about who I am. Uh, very, very uh, ordinary at that. And so for these sort of uh, things to happen in my life, some of these amazing stories that you read about in the book, are only because, of, again, of the provident, I believe in providence, but also uh, the principles that I adopted and I write about quite a bit in the book. So when it comes time you know, for extraordinary tales, uh, I could give so many, and uh, I'll just give you a few screenshots. I'm not going to go into these stories specifically, but I just wanted to give you that, that sort of background about um, how I grew up, uh, sort of reinforcing the fact that I am average uh, in every way. And uh, there's really no magical fairies that came and, and made things happen. Uh, it really was by embracing certain principles. And I'm going to talk through those principles a little bit and uh, how they had an impact. Now, the 12 principles that make up the book, none of them would anyone say, wow, I'd never thought of that. In fact, all of them are pretty common everyday principles, which again is the beauty of the book and sort of how these principles worked in my life. It didn't take anything extraordinary in terms of principles to allow for an extraordinary life. And so that should that should make all of us feel good. But at the same time, don't, don't think that when I talk about risk boldly 
and often that this is something that everyone does. Because a lot of these principles, you will all agree that, yeah, that makes sense as a principle, but my challenge to you when you hear what these principles are, are do you truly live them? And so I will punctuate that point a few times as we, as we move through to really challenge you in that do you really live them? So for instance, to risk boldly and often, have you ever put your life at risk? So that could be um, climbing a mountain, could be swimming across San Francisco Bay, could be, um, you know, whatever it might be for you in terms of on a personal level or and then on a professional level, have you ever been fired? Have you ever really pushed the edges uh, to benefit ultimately uh, your organization? So there's, there's different things when I talk about risk. I'm talking about ri real risk. I'm not just talking about, hey, did you, uh, did you buy a Chevy versus a Ford and hope that, you know, you'd get a, an extra 10,000 miles out of transmission. I'm not talking about those sort of risks. When I say risks boldly and often, I'm talking about some pretty major risks. So that's one of the principles. And again, you, you say to yourself, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, of course I take risks. But again, my challenge will be uh, show me the evidence of, of, a, of a life that you've lived uh, that has included risks. The second principle is to seek and chase vision. And a lot of times, again, I will ask people, what is your vision? And 90% of people uh, would say, oh, well, of course I have a vision. But when I press kind of like the secondary question and I ask people to tell me what their vision is, they can't articulate that vision. So while everyone would say, well, of course you need to have uh, personal vision or professional vision uh, for your career or for your life, for your, for your family, most people can't articulate it. So conceptually, we all agree with it, but in practicality, most people actually don't do it. So that's another uh, example uh, of you know really owning these sort of principles and these concepts to a to, to more of an extreme level. And not one of these is going to suddenly make for an extraordinary tale, but when you start combining all of these together, uh, it really will have an impact on, on the opportunities that are created in your life. Another one is to believe in something bigger than yourself. So this is the whole concept of faith. And, and I'm not here to preach to anyone or, or to sell anyone on, on my faith specifically, but I think it is really important that you do have a belief in something bigger than yourself. For me, it's in my Christian faith that I find, that I find this expression, uh, but definitely believe in something bigger than myself because I know if left to myself, again, being average or perhaps below average in many different ways, uh, I wouldn't accomplish much. But I know because there's something out there bigger than me that I've been able to accomplish a great deal uh, thanks to that assistance, if you will. Another principle that I speak a lot about is to build a team of life givers. And so it's, it's clear from numerous studies that you are basically the five people that you hang out the, the most with. So think about that for a second. <clears throat> so who are the five people that you spend the most time with? Well, that's pretty much who you are. And so you have to really think, are these people life givers or life takers? And so if you want to get really simple, you can bifurcate people into two camps. And obviously, I'm very, very general, very stereotypical, but perhaps it will help someone. And there's people that suck the life out of you and there's people that can give you life. And if, if you're hanging around with two or more uh, life, you know, people that take the life out of you, uh, you may be that same way. And so you really want to surround yourself with people that give you life. I'm very, very fortunate that I have a tremendous amount of people like that, and the people that are most closest to me are all life givers. So this is a really key. And again, you, you'll hear that and you'll say, well, of course I just hang out with life givers, but really, really analyze that. And be really uh, do a lot of introspection and really ask yourself that question: Are they truly life givers, and what's the evidence of that? And it's not that you can't hang out with other people for sure, uh, but remember, if you're going to become like the five most people you hang out with, uh, you want to make sure that they're life givers. So this would include things like having uh, mentors and such. And then uh, I talked to you about marrying well, and that's just a I won't go into the details of that picture, but. Um, we, had, we had a lot of fun um, around the holidays. So the next principle that I would share is to embrace humility and service. And um, so 
I believe that we were created to serve. And uh, and service takes a lot of humility. I think they go hand in hand. And so another one, one, one of the principles is to embrace humility and service. And again, we would all hear that and say, well, of course, I'm going to be humble and of course, I'm going to be service oriented. Uh, but ask yourself or have other people that are close to you and to help you do some self-analysis or self-reflection and see if you're really hitting the mark in that way. And most of us as leaders, it's hard sometimes to, to really operate in humility. So you always have to do a lot of self-checking. Another principle is to find and feel passion. It's amazing how many people don't have passion. If you ask people what they're passionate about, um, and, and then, again, you just keep pressing. What's the second question? So the second question is, okay, I say I'm a passionate person. Okay, the second question is, what am I passionate about? And then the third question, so you keep digging deeper and deeper, is really uh, how, how does that passion manifest itself? What's the outcome in my life? And so uh, people can have multiple passions. So one of my passions is uh, Argentine tango. And so it doesn't matter what it is. It could be very specific to work. It could be very specific to play. But the important thing is to find and feel passion because passion creates energy, creates creativity. So passion is another one of the principles. I'll finish up with these principles here in a minute, and then certainly we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. Another key item is uh, perseverance and resiliency because tough things happen. Life is hard. Marriage is hard. Work is hard. Uh, play is hard. Uh, life is just hard. And you have to have a certain level of perseverance and resiliency, the ability to bounce back when things don't go your way. Because one of the stories I'll tell you is a story of great failure of mine. And uh, if I didn't have the ability to persevere and be resilient, I certainly wouldn't have many extraordinary tales to share. Another one is fail forward. So John Maxwell, pretty famous writer, talks a lot about the concept of fail forward. <clears throat> so we're all going to have failures in our life, but it's how we react to them that makes the big difference. And so obviously we all know people who got stuck. They fail somewhere along the line, and it still haunts them maybe 10, 20 years later. And it's okay to fail, but you just got to get through it, have that resiliency, and make something better happen as a result. Another one is wonderment and continuous learning. It's amazing to me that how many people stop learning once they wait. And I think it's really important that you always um, seek to learn more. So it could be professional, it could be personal, whatever combination is for you. But it's really important that you that you have this sort of sense of continuous learning and, and wonderment and just really explore uh, the world. Or your, it doesn't have to be the world. It could be whatever, again, is of interest to you. Uh, that you don't sit still. A lot of these find could be applied to our workplace as well, uh, you know, in terms of learning and, and really getting to the next stage of our profession. So another principle is really to work your ass off. <clears throat> There's nothing that's worth doing that's really easy. And so again, you, some people will say, well, of course I do that. But I would really challenge you, you know, are you the, whether it's on, you know, you could pick any sport, sports the easiest really for me to relate to. Uh, but if it's tennis, are you the person that's out there, you know, an hour before the, the rest of your uh, tennis team and, and hitting, you know, a thousand serves to try and get better? Are you, are you the person that gets up at 4.30 a.m. Or, or stays up late at 10.30 p.m., whatever works for your schedule, but puts in the extra effort? Uh, so that they can get faster or that they can get uh, better at their particular craft. And it, it's the same with our profession, right? Are you the person that tries to do the least amount or are you the person that tries to do the most? And you can tell. I mean, you can tell by the outcome. Volunteering is very uh, critical, and I mean volunteer and giving until it hurts. Because this helps with humility. It helps with uh, <clears throat> compassion. It helps with empathy. And when this principle is really operating deeply in your life, extraordinary things happen. So if I, if, again, I, I keep pushing on it because it's a really important di differentiator on these principles. You have to get to the second and third level. Yeah, everyone would say, I volunteer. So I would say, what's the next question? How often do you volunteer? What do you do? So they may do it once a year. And that's great. They take a day off and volunteer once a year. It's great. And not saying anything negative about it. I'm saying do more. 
So you get to the third level. And then does it hurt? Is it painful? So I do some things, I, we do some things in our lives that are, that are painful in a way in terms of, of what we might give, and I'm not going to give the specifics of that because that's not the purpose. But the purpose is to tell you that uh, you know that you're giving uh, to a very deep level when, when you have to think about it because it causes some sort of hurt. Another principle is to build strong identity. This is really tough. This is the one I've struggled with the most and I've written quite extensively about it in the book. It's, it's very hard. I don't know too many people that have actually got this whole concept of identity. But if I ask the average person who they are, the first thing they respond with is what their title is at work. And that's not identity. But yet, that's how I respond. I talk about my accomplishments. I talk about my work. But I never got down to, like, who was I really? And that's what I'm talking about. It's that second, that third, that fourth level of questioning to really figure out who you are. A lot of us, we're so consumed with, with awards, with other external recognition, or we're consumed with the way we look or the way we dress. Uh, we get obsessive about it. Uh, but that's not identity. That's false identity. So this principle is so key, uh, as are the other ones, but I'm, I'm particularly passionate about this one because it's one that I struggle with the most. I believe that you need to be physically fit. And I understand that there are medical issues that happen with people, and they're not physically fit. And I have total grace and, and, and admiration for those people that want to be fit and can't be because of some, something that's beyond their control. So please uh, understand my heart that this is not about judging anyone that's not physically fit because of some medical issue or, or some genetic issue. Uh, I can get that, and, and um, so that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about for those of us who are able, we need to be fit, especially if we're leaders. Um, I'm speaking primarily to a health uh, audience, particularly if we're in healthcare. I think we owe it uh, to be physically fit because when you're fit, things happen that can't happen if you're not fit. And again, those lead to extraordinary tales. So it's not just about physical fitness. It's all of these other principles together that really set the stage to create opportunities for extraordinary tales. So physical fitness, and, and you know, the last thing I'll say about this too, there, there's many, many studies that tie physical fitness with uh, mental acuity and, and different things of that nature. That's why the military spends so much time on fitness um, because they understand the impact in the battlefield. So you want to do everything with excellence. And this is another hard area for me because there's a lot of times I just want to take the shortest, uh, the shortest way. I want to take the shortest route. And I think we're all sort of like that in many ways, right? We, we want to take the easiest way. We want to get things over with as soon as we can. But it's those things that, um, again, the extraordinary tales rarely happen without some aspect of excellence uh, being involved in your life. And so whether it's on a personal level or professional level, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. It's, but whatever you do, do it with excellence. So if you're, like, I was a janitor for a couple of years. And I knew, I just wanted to do it right. Um, there were a lot of times I didn't want to do it right, and I didn't. But even as a young person, as a janitor, I, there were times when I caught the concept of, you know what, this is important for someone. Uh, it's important I do my job right. It's important I do with excellence. And so this was sort of drilled into me as I was growing up. And so I'm very grateful for this particular principle. But we shouldn't do anything <clears throat> if we're not willing to do, do it with excellence. And, and when you do things with excellence, they lead to just extraordinary thing. I touched on this one already. I think this is our last one, uh, reflection and application. But you, you need to uh, take time to reflect. For me, it's when I climb. So I, I climb mountains, and it gives me a chance to do many, many hours, if not days, of self-reflection. I will take retreat and do self-reflection. Uh, so I get away and, you know, really look at how my performance, uh, how I'm doing in all different areas of life. But a lot of times we don't take time for reflection, right? So, again, you look at it and you're like, well, of course I, I reflect. Well, I would challenge you the second level question is really when? Really, number three, how long was it? Four, how often do you do it? Five, what were the outcomes? So if you can't get to that level of answering, then you're probably not really living that principle. So here's a little bit of contact information, and I'm not going to go uh, any further into the principles. So that was sort of a summary of, of the different principles that, that are outlined in the book. And then associated with each of those principles in the book are our story.
stories, and, and you know, a, a fair amount of them are sort of these extraordinary tales. Some of them, though, are, are about failure when, it, when the extraordinary didn't happen, but what I learned from it. Um, so there's a lot of different things. And my hope, again, going back to why I wrote this, is that other people who are just like me, again, I already painted my life portrait for you with very average, if not below average, that despite those circumstances growing up and despite my early career circumstances, despite my collegiate circumstances, despite my circumstances in the military, that applying and really, really deeply living these principles all combined together uh, enabled me to, to, to really get past uh, that very difficult beginning and have these extraordinary tales. And so if I can do it, really anyone can do it, and I, and I mean that with uh, full sincerity and with full humility. Uh, so there's nothing special about me. Uh, but there is something special about those principles, and when you apply them deeply and in concert and symphony with one another, extraordinary things can happen. So I'm going to stop with that, Lori, and see if there's any online questions or if there's any verbal questions, and, and then um, to the extent that we have time, I'll be happy to embellish upon a story, and then we can uh, end, obviously, with, with our drawing. Okay. Um, we do have several questions and comments, and I'll, I'll share the comments as well as the questions. Um, <clears throat> Lisa has a question. Um, she wants to know, she said, having not read the book, what do you think of the concept of emotional intelligence, and do you think it has anything to do with your success? Yeah, I, I, I believe uh, clearly in emotional intelligence and really understanding, uh, you know, our environment and, and the people that you're with and responding accordingly. And certainly that has a lot to do with, with anyone's success. Uh, so I think it's important to have that understanding. I've done a lot of reflection in that area. I've taken, uh, I've read the book um, on emotional intelligence, social intelligence, and different types of, uh, you know, spiritual intelligence, and, and I've always found those very intriguing and then tried to apply what I've learned from them. But, yeah, that, that's also very, very important, and I think, you know, you could even weave in some of the principles I already talked about and, and how they interact or how they intersect with uh, emotional intelligence. Okay, Helen um, just makes an observation. She says, I guess it doesn't matter where or how you start your life, but rather how you live it every day. You seem to prove that in this book in Life Review. You can change your life's trajectory. This really points to that. Um, yeah, and I would, I would agree. It, it doesn't matter where you are today. So this, this was an evolution, if you will, will. It wasn't like a one-day catalyst that happened and suddenly, you know, these extraordinary tales started. Um, for me, uh, I did start adopting these principles fairly early, you know, after I, 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 they just sort of got sprinkled along the way, but added as time went on. And I wouldn't say that I was fully functioning in any of those 12 ever. Uh, like I mentioned, the identity one I'm still wrestling with, but I know it's just really important. I'm trying to embed it in my life. And uh, so you can start anyway. You could be 50 years old and, and and not had much happen, but adopt these sort of principles, and you, you will see a change. John wants to know what the best risk you took was and why it was the best risk. So, oh, so many come to my mind that uh, I think moving. So I've, I've been a proponent of the concept of go to grow. And sometimes to really have exponential growth in your life, you've you got to get out of your comfort zone. So taking risks, like we were so happy in Colorado. We, um, my wife and I both were sort of raised in Colorado after I came from Germany. Uh, we w went to a utopian college town. We both graduated. We were in a great church. We had great friends. I mean, life could not have been better our first Actually, both our children were born in Colorado, and, and things were so good. And I recall the conversation that the two of us had. It was like, you know what? There's got to be more. Our life is so good right now, and I think we were like 27, 28. Our life is so good right now, but I think there's more. But we weren't going to get that more staying in the comfortable situation. So we took a huge risk by moving, and we moved from, from a great utopian town to a town almost the opposite, and I don't want to mention the town just in case people are from there, um, but for us it was difficult to leave Fort Collins, Colorado for another city in Colorado that wasn't quite uh, at the same uh, level in, in our opinion, and it was a huge risk to leave our friends, to leave our church, to leave my employer, 
to take on a new job, and this role happened to be in, in more in IT than any previous roles I had, and uh, it just paid off so well. We had exponential growth, and then we repeated that. So I got comfortable there, and we repeated that. We moved to Tennessee, and then eventually Cleveland, and even you know more recently, seven years, uh, four months, and 19 days ago, uh, moving to Texas, and uh, that was a big risk too. So uh, I was I, I look back at my career and say every time I changed my role was a big risk, but it always paid off because it caused a tremendous amount of growth. Wendy would like to know, what was your turnaround point? Was it an event or just a decision you made that changed your path? And I'm not sure there was one single event. That's what I was sharing. It's sort of an evolution, and it's not like I ever like thought about, oh, it's these 12 things that are really making a difference. They just sort of happen along the way, but, but early failure uh, and I, you know, I may talk about one of them later. Early failures certainly were were pretty big milestones in that I needed to really sort of you know do things differently, or else my life might be marred by complete failures. So I would say um, getting you know uh, flunking out of college, um, uh, getting booted almost booted out of the army, but not living my my original dream, which. Uh, is related to the Army, which, again, I may get into in a little bit. Uh, so the different things that happen along the way. Um, I also came to faith later in, in life uh, while I was in college, uh, and that was really a big big turning point for me as well. So it was really a combination of different things um, that happened over a period of time. All right. Um, Helen would like to know, if you're anticipating a down day, what thoughts run through your head to get you psyched up to face the challenge ahead? Like if you have to let someone go at work, how do you get your head around it to do it with dignity? Yeah, so around our dining room table, uh, when our kids lived with us, we'd always do this thing called highs and lows. So we'd share one great thing that happened in the day and, and uh, what kind of a low point was. And I know for me that no matter how low of a day, uh, I'm always encouraged when I remember that what we're doing is such sacred work. Uh, and where, where, I, where I serve, you know, we talk about it as saving lives, that what we do on a daily basis, we've proven that statistically really does save lives. I mean, all of us that work in healthcare IT, whether we're on the provider side, payer side, or uh, on, the, on the vendor supplier side, uh, we're all working together. And, Ultimately, we're saving lives, and so I'm, when I get discouraged and have to make those hard, hard decisions, I just remember, you know what? At the end of the day, we're saving lives, and so that's something that goes, you know, that's like eternal, um, as opposed to something that might just, you know, be negative for a day or even a month. Um, I just try to keep that long-term perspective in mind, and it's like, no, you know what? We, we're saving lives. So yeah, I had a terrible run-in with, uh, maybe I got a ticket or. Uh, had a difficult meeting at work, uh, whatever it might be, I, at the end of the day, it's like, you know what, we saved lives today. So I always, I always think about that. Great. Uh, Amy would appreciate hearing some thoughts about learning to say no when needed. Seeking excellence, fitness, that all means something has to give. Yeah, that's hard for me. I'm not real strong with it. Um, I, I go through a process, so I do have, I, I do believe and I do write about having a strategic plan for your life, and uh, it's a pretty simple thing, it's actually a one page plan, so it's not, don't think it's like a hundred page thesis or anything, but I think by going through this planning process has really helped me say no, I still, like I said, I still struggle there, but it's really helped me, so what, what I do uh, is when new opportunities present themselves, I look at my plan, I look at my strategies, my mission, my vision, my values, and my objectives, and I'm like, does this fit in the plan? And if the answer is no, uh, that's an immediate filter to probably not do it. I always leave the door open a little bit, though, because maybe it's something that I need to really think about and not be, you know, I don't want to be so rigid. Uh, having a written plan, you could easily, you know, become very bureaucratic and rigid and you miss opportunities. But I think it probably knocks out 80% of them. And so having this plan that I thought through, I, I, I review it monthly, I, I go on a retreat annually, I rate myself, I have other people help me. Um, I think that really helps you say, say no, and it, but it's really, really difficult. I just, you know, I do some things for Team USA in a sport called duathlon. I was just 
uh, because I also do triathlons. I, I, I happened to do really well in a couple, uh, a few months ago, and so I just got an invitation to try out for the national team for triathlon, and uh, I just had to say no. It's painful for those who know me and how much I'm into the sport. Uh, I had to say no because I would just get to the point that I couldn't do everything with excellence. And if excellence is going to be one of my principles, but I spread myself so thin that I'm going to lose, uh, I'm going to lose family. I'm going to lose uh, being on a on a team that I want to be on. You know, I don't want to lose that whole sort of concept of excellence. So that's another thing that another filter for me that helps me me to say no. And on a practical level, you know, I, I serve. I'm very fortunate. I, I get to serve on, on several boards and including some universities and uh, like advisory type uh, roles. And my 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 latest role to help me say no is that I will only add a new role like that if I get rid of one. So um, so I know I'm at my max capacity to perform with excellence when it comes to those sorts of roles. Uh, so if I if I am intrigued by one and I want to take it on, I will I will uh, resign from another one. There are several questions around the same um, topic of work life balance and. Um, people are interested in how you are able to balance work, family time, and the time you spend alone in reflection. I think you talked a little bit about it, but since there are so many questions, can you focus on that yeah. for a second? <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, I think having the retreat is very helpful. Uh, because it forces you to kind of rate yourself. So we do a lot of rating of ourselves at work, uh, but we don't necessarily do it on a personal level. And so um, so that's why I really encourage that. And then you kind of find out, well, am I hitting the mark? So like in my personal plan, you know, I talk about my family, I talk about my work, and I talk about play, essentially, or kind of the three big buckets, and, you know, service. So there's like four big buckets. And uh, so when I go through this rating and – self-evaluation and also my family takes part in that, I get a lot of very candid feedback and you realize pretty quickly, wow, am I living a balanced life or not? Am I going over the edge too much here or there? And it's a very important discussion to have with the people that you love uh, and, it's, and, and, and I like bringing sort of a little bit of science to it as well and having these data points. So that's one thing that helps set the stage because in that process you also talk about your mission and vision. So how do you know if you have a balanced life? Because your, your balance will be different than someone else's, uh, depending on what your mission and vision is. So having that established is really helpful because I can't give anyone a percentage. Like you should do 25% of your time here and 10% there because it's different for everyone depending on what their, what their goals are. So having that planning process is, is really key. And again, I write about that, uh, I think, a couple times in the book on, on how to do that and, and, and what we've experienced as a result. The, uh, it, but it's tough. So I'm struggling uh, like other people. I think a lot of people think, wow, Ed's got it pretty much figured out because he's like hitting, you know, on all 12 cylinders in all these different areas. Uh, but you only see part of my life, right? So um, it's, 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 it's not probably as balanced as what people think it is. And so it's something that I'm working on as well. And so, again, I'm using these principles to sort of help me focus. Like, am I doing things with excellence? Am I, am I re are my relationships done with excellence? Uh, am I shortchanging my relationships in order to have success at work? Um, and so you really have to ask yourself those questions. There was a time, and it sort of tied back into the story I was going to tell, uh, where um, you know I gave up my lifelong dream uh, to become an Army colonel um, because it was affecting my family. And so I made the difficult decision to resign my commission uh, a few years ago. Uh, so it's, it's trade-offs you have to make. You have to make those hard decisions. You have to listen to the people around you. Uh, you know, I talk about the relationships uh, in some of the, at least two of the principles are around relationships and the people you hang out with, you have to listen to them, get their feedback, and, and um, do, yeah, and, you know, do a lot of self-reflection. But you, you do, don't shortchange your own time. That would be the last thing I'll say on this, is uh, don't shortchange that quiet time. So I think everyone needs quiet time daily. I, you know, because I'm like always trying to do something else, I'm like trying to multitask my flight time, it doesn't work real well. So I love getting away for me to the mountains, but sometimes it's just like swimming. So it's going to be different for everyone, but, you know, when you're swimming, that's pretty boring, and you get a lot of self-reflection time. 
for me, getting away to the mountains is also a great opportunity for me to be away from everything and, and do that self-reflection. And I think if you don't do self-reflection, uh, you're you're uh, going to have a tough time not only having a balanced life but but a meaningful life because you got to think, be thinking about, man, what are you doing? Why are you doing them? And what are the outcomes? I think too often we live in such a fast-paced world, and I'm as guilty as anyone. So please, and you know, the other part of my heart is like, don't think I've got it completely figured out. I've done. I've got some things figured out, and that's why I'm sharing the book. But certainly, I'm a work in progress, like everyone else. But you know, if you don't, if, you know, if someone said, you know, the unexamined life's not worth living. So it's really important to take the time to really examine yourself. Okay, um, Josephine and Stuart have similar questions. Josephine wants to know who or what inspires you, and along with that, Stuart asked, who's one of your mentors that stands out? Yeah, so I, I do have, and I write about this as well, I, I have formal mentors every uh, even year. Um, and then I mentor someone every odd year, but actually because of some things that we're doing in the workplace, I'm actually mentoring people every year right now. But that, that was my pattern for a long time. And um, man, they all stand out because they, they, they filled a different, a different niche for me. Uh, but one of them that stands out perhaps the most is uh, a, a friend of mine who's a CFO at a big health system, and uh, he's the person who believed in me before I believed in myself. And uh, so he agreed to mentor me, and uh, he took me under his wing, sort of taught me a lot of different things about leadership, taught me some things I needed to know about finance, uh, taught me some things I needed to know about being a man. Uh, this was back in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, so this is not too long ago. This is about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, because of his belief in me, uh, because of his confidence in me, because of the things that he was training me, you know, he really paved the way for me to become a CIO at a very young age uh, back in Cleveland. And so uh, he's, he's the mentor that I would cite, you know, that, that helped pave the way for me to become a CIO. But I'm meeting with my 2008 mentor. I'm so thrilled on Tuesday. So uh, my 2008 mentor uh, is a uh, retired hospital president. And I get together with him probably once a year. Because there'll be something, you know, maybe it's uh, related to my uh, my employer or something like that, where he'll have great insight. And so I call him up, and he immediately responds, and uh, he's there for me. And so, you know, his so that's sort of his niche is he understands, you know, my workplace environment. So he's a great person to speak to with that. But it's great having all these mentors. I can go back to so many different people. I have relationships with all of them still, going back 20 years, and uh, it's just amazing. So. So to answer that second part of the question was who, who are who's the mentor that really stands out? Uh, Kevin Roberts, CFO at, at Barnes Jewish, is, is is the one um, that probably stands out the most because of helping me get, become who I am today and as a CIO. Uh, the first part of the question was like sort of who inspires you? There's a lot of people. Um, there's a huge list of people that inspire me. Um, I love people who've overcome adversity because I kind of look at my story a little bit of overcoming adversary. adversary. Uh, I, I, I created a lot of that adversity myself, uh, which is not good, uh, but did. And uh, so I, I get inspired by, by hearing other people's stories and other people talk about uh, what they've accomplished uh, by, and how they overcome um, adversity. So th there's a lot of personal people uh, that I could cite that people uh, wouldn't know their names if I mentioned them. Um, but certainly there's, there's some high profile individuals who, um, you know, serve as an inspiration for me as well. Okay. The last question, how do you motivate others to work, live with excellence? So what I learned a long, long time ago, uh, when I was first being developed as a leader is that you should work with the motivated and not try to motivate the worker. And um, it sounds sort of trite, but I think there, it's pretty profound. Because <clears throat> I think you're going to waste a lot of energy trying to motivate people. Um, they either have it, I'm speaking on a general basis here, they either have it or they don't. I want to pour my energy into people that have it. And so uh, if I find people that don't have uh, that motivation for what, whether it's excellence or working hard or some of these principles, I'm not going to give them much time. Because I have got a limited amount of time, and I'm going to invest in people who are already motivated and help them get to the next level because they're going to have the greatest impact. I can move someone from a two to a four maybe in terms of the level of motivation for excellence, 
and spend, you know, uh, a lot of units, but I'd rather spend a lot of my my units, my time units, on getting someone to from an eight to a ten. Can you imagine what that person's going to be like as a ten, as opposed to someone that you get to a four or five? So I've really learned that, and so I try to move people out that aren't motivated, uh, that don't operate with excellence. You know, we have standards; they don't meet the standards. You try and help them, um, uh, but if they don't have the self motivation to get better, I'm not going to waste any time on them. I'm going to focus on, on the top performers that that are motivated. And it was, it was interesting because I I had the opportunity to hear uh, Magic Johnson. Uh, speak, you know, the basketball players speak uh, last week, and he was talking about the same thing. Someone asked him the same question, and, and he had a very, very similar response. He's like, man, I just try not to hire them in the first place because I don't have time to try to motivate people. You either, you either got it or you don't. Now, obviously, I'm speaking generally, some, there's always a case where someone's got a bad situation and they need someone to come alongside to encourage them and help them. I'm all about that as well, but generally speaking, I just work with the motivated. I don't try to motivate people. That's a great answer. Um, thanks, Ed. Thanks for the discussion. I read the book and I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure anyone listening who hasn't already read it will enjoy it when they do. Um, before we wrap up, I want to let Wendy know she won a Kindle today. And Helen, Amy, and John, I'll be contacting you about getting you the books that you won today. Um, thanks to Cheryl. I know that the book is available and prime eligible on Amazon. So if you're interested, that's where you can get the book. Um, Ed is willing to speak with anyone who'd like to contact him, and you can do that at markstango at gmail.com. Um, as a reminder, you'll be receiving a follow-up email that'll have a link to the recording of this session. Um, I'd like to wish you all a happy holiday season, and I look forward to seeing you at future HIS Talk webinars. Enjoy the rest of your day.